say proudly that uh, I'm very stable because I'm very close to the center of gravity. <laughs> but uh, they have said to make me slightly unstable by making me a few inches away from the center <laughs> of gravity. But it has the advantage that uh, you can see me. Before I say anything, I'd like to simply say, you know, I thank Ghana. I have a very special relationship with Ghana, not only because of men and women of letters that I have met, but in some other ways, there's no way of being a Kenyan and not in Ghana, not only because of what happened recently, but even quite earlier in terms of the entertainment of the history of Kenya and that of Ghana through the work and life of um, Kwame Nkrumah. So it was very natural for me when I found myself in exile and I had no passport and I didn't want to take on British traveling papers, I felt that Ghana came to, my, to the rescue of my personality and for many years of my years in exile, I traveled on a Ghana passport, so really. So, so when I come to Ghana, I'm very genuine when I say, whenever I come here, I really come back home. So it's as a Ghanaian this time, wearing the hat of a Ghanaian, that I want to announce uh, the, a very important program, which is the initiative of the Institute here, that is African Thinkers Program, uh, which according to the description will in fact you know, be able to discuss African thinkers, uh, not only the colonial, post-colonial, but even beyond, you know, before the colonial, in other words, from antiquity to the present. It's a big challenge, but I think it's a worthwhile challenge. And uh, I'm very pleased to say I support the program and I declare the United program open. Today, I want to discuss what I call the future of African scholarship based on the theme of resistance to European metaphysical empires. The, actually, before I start, I want first of all to ask a question, which I always ask, I have to ask anyway, uh, just to show, be sure I, am, I know where I am. I like all of us, since we are here for a conference to do with African studies, please, I want to ask only three questions or two anyway, and please raise your hand. How many in this hall have ever read a whole book in an African language? Please raise it. Yes? Great. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have written a book in an African language? How many? Three, four, five. Great. How many have, to narrow it a little bit, have written a paper, a conference paper, say, or any paper at address in an African language? Again, seems like all the hands are coming from the same quarter. 
Okay. <laughs> Market silence in the rest of the... <laughs> okay. Now, I just want to be clear about that. And I think you can see that in itself tells a very interesting story. Okay. Uh, the opening, and it takes us back to the opening address addresses to the first International Congress of Africanists held here in Accra, Ghana in 1962. That is 50 years ago. And these addresses are really instructive in their contemporary relevance. The chairman, Dr. Onu Kadike, hoped the Congress might be the beginning of an era when African studies will become progressively the concern of African scholars themselves, and when Africa's history, culture, and development will be looked at from the African point of view. Its success was vital to the progress of African scholarship, the world reorientation to this continent, and the whole future of scholarship in Africa. For him, the Congress, and I quote, was a landmark in our efforts to regain, regain our intellectual and cultural independence. It is notable that Deke used the word regain, which assumed a previous existence of that intellectual and cultural independence. But it is equally notable that he did not mention the languages in which that independence had been expressed. Kwame Nkrumah's speech carried similar hopes that the conference would be a major step towards an Africa-centered view of itself its history and culture. His address is remarkable for its continued reference to knowledge existing in African uh, languages. He specifically mentions languages like Kiswahili, Giz, Amharic, Hausa, Fufade, Kanuri, Nupe, Dagbane, as examples in which documentary sources of African knowledge could be found. He saw the conference as an attempt, among other aims, to share experience in this common endeavor of presenting our history as the history of an African people. And he never, of course, ever, ever left out the diaspora. He came back to the same theme, when a year later, he gave the Africa Genius speech at the opening of this Institute of African Studies. In every other paragraph, he talked about the study of African history, culture, and institutions, languages, and arts. For him, a study and development of African languages was not a side issue. African languages were central in African scholarship, development, and in Africa's relationship to the diaspora and the world. He, he, did, not call, he did not call for linguistic self-isolation, for he saw the role of other languages like Arabic, English, French, and the Portuguese, where Dike, the author of the brilliant trade and politics in the Niger Delta, the champion of all sources as valid historical evidence, but where he assumed that through English and European languages, Africa scholarship could establish its identity, presumably in an European linguistic heaven, Kwame saw African languages as equal constructors of a multilinguistic heaven. Clearly, for him, that is Nkrumah, African languages were not a lower rung on the ladder to an English heaven, but rather as equal partners 
in the construction of a common heaven. It is fair, therefore, to pause and ask, after 50 years, have we regained the cultural and intellectual independence at Dike so as having been lost to colonialism? There is no doubt that in terms of quantity and quality of scholarly production, African scholarship and general scholarship on Africa <coughs> is a far cry <coughs> from that prevailing in the days that Dicke, I'm sorry, but there's a mosquito following me around. <laughs> And in the same, I believe the same one I've been struggling with every night. You can find my room with a, with a broom chasing the mosquito around. <laughs> they found me here. Anyway, what I'm saying is that if you could actually look at the quantity and quality of scholars you produced, this is a far cry from the days that Dicke and Nkrumah spoke about. Hegelian Africa, enveloped in the dark mantle of the night, and that of Trevor Roper, for whom the continent had only darkness to exhibit, and darkness could not be the subject of history, this is gone forever, thanks to this scholarship. <coughs> this scholarship, I want to be clear, this scholarship by all of us and others before us has made Africa visible in the world, fulfilling Dicke's vision. But have we fulfilled the Nkrumah's vision? It is clear that African scholarship has achieved this great visibility in the world by also the tremendous fate of making itself invisible in Africa. African scholarship wears a linguistic mask with the magic quality of making, it invis of making it invisible to the majority in Africa and spontaneously visible to those with a key made in Europe. Thus, we arrive at a position that is the opposite of that envisioned in Kwame Nkrumah's speech. We can only see ourselves through European eyes at the minimum. In the same genius speech, Nkrumah posed the question, <coughs> are we really sure that our students are in touch with the life of the nation. Perhaps we should rephrase the question. Are we sure that after 50 years of modern African scholarship, we are in touch with the nation, the continent, African peoples? Or more basic and consequential, is the independent African state now in existence for the same 50 years in touch with its people. My friends, we only have to look at the place of African languages in modern African states to see, to, to see the implications of that question. Let's put it this way. Think of the state as a company in which every citizen has equal shares and therefore expecting equal returns. Now, one of the basic features, functions of the state is the administration of justice. For the state has the machinery to effectively ca carry out that function from making laws by the legis legislative bodies, their enforcement by a combination of the police, the judiciary and the prison system. One can of course think of justice 
in a narrow juristic or legal sense and also in a broad and more fundamental sense of social and economic justice, even, shall I say, scholastic justice. But all, but all the senses are connected. The narrow legal sense and its implications for the larger social scene was best articulated by one of the great writer of, of the world, James Joyce, in his article, Ireland at the Bar, in the, in the Italian journal, Il Pocolo della Sera. The article tells a story of four or five peasants from the village of Mamutrasana in the western province, province of Ireland arrested and accused of the murder of a woman. Among the accused is a 60-year-old man. The accused did not know English. The court resorted to the services of an interpreter. Asked if he had seen the woman on the morning in question, the bewildered old man would go into the lengthy explanation in Gaelic or Irish the officious interpreter who re reduced the entire e explanation into, he says, no, your worship. Asked if he was in the vicinity, the old man went through a similar lengthy explanation. The interpreter reduced the whole thing to, he says, no, your worship. The man was sentenced to death and according, according to Joyce, legend had it that even the hangman could not make himself understood, understood by the victim and angrily kicked the unhappy man in the head to force him into the news. The article was published in, on 16 September 1907, but the case of the Irish old man a deaf mute before an English language justice system could be describing a scene in any independent African nation today where the majority are rendered linguistically deaf and mute by the government policies that have set European languages as the normative measure of worth in every aspect of national life. This situation is not a consequence of an accident of history. It is the fulfillment of a conscious imperial design in a long history of conquest, whether in reference to Ireland in 1907 or Africa today. Let's focus on Ireland for a little while. Ireland, England's first colony, was a historical nursery of patterns of power relations that would be reproduced in Asia and Africa later. Among these is the power relationship between the language of the conqueror and the language of the vanquished. Following the Anglo-Norman conquest and settlement of Ireland, London enacted several acts aimed at protecting English language against the subversive encroachment of Irish or Gaelic, a language that had a much richer history of intellectual production than English. Among other penalties, the 1366 Statute of Kilkenny threatened to confiscate any land of any English or any Irish living among them who would use Irish among themselves, contrary to that old ordinance. By 16th century, the ordinances had failed to achieve their end. Now enter Spencer, or the Shepherd's Calendar, and the Fairy Queen. 
a well-known English poet, contemporary of Shakespeare. But Spencer was also a settler planter in Munster, Ireland. In 1598, Spencer published his book, A View of Ireland at the Present Time, a dialogic manifesto on how to tame the Irish through the erasure of their memory. Naming, yes, names, names, and language, language, were the suggested instruments to that end. For as one of the interlocutors in the dialogue says, it has ever been the use of the conqueror to despise the language of the conquered and to force him by all means to learn his. The book and the sentiment are significant because they come at a time when the nascent European nation states have emerged from the linguistic hegemony of Latin and the religious hegemony of the Catholic Church and when the rival nationalism are on the rise. We have all heard of Spanish Amada, for instance. And also, the mercantile, mercantile capitalism is turning imperial and colonial, with the black body at the center of the emerging commerce. And those who think of globalization as something which started yesterday, and who are working ecstatic about how we might become part of that globalization, Africa was always part of globalization at the very beginnings of modern capitalism. This follows, this commerce follows Europe's discovery of America and the sea route to India. Events that Adam Smith and Marx after him would later describe as revolutionary in their impact on the modern. I am not sure which gave rise to the other, but nationalism, mercantile capitalism, and colonial expansion fed into each other and they all end in African enslavement. Walter Raleigh was Spencer's settler neighbor in Munster Island, and he would go on to found Virginia, the first truly English colony in America. In the American slave plantation that followed the settlements, African languages, including the drum, the talking drum would later be banned, some of those breaking the ban, even earning the noose around their necks. Thus, the first matters for African languages were a, a diasporic Africans. Though I have not come across evidence of actual banning of African languages on the continent, but it is a fact that each of the post-Berlin colonizing nations put their languages at the center of the imperial universe. I want to emphasize here that this, as you think it's of Ireland, this is, this is a truly a colonial phenomenon, not, an, not a black and white issue. Imperial Japan, for instance, when in 1930 they annexed Korea, made Koreans take on Japanese names and language a policy reversed after the, after the defeat of the Japanese colonialism. And by the way, you go to Japan, there is a huge Korean diaspora in Japan, but you do not know because they were all forced to take on Japanese names and of course language, and that's the identity vanished until recently when the Korean language movement in Japan. When the USA or the United States of America annexed Haiti, it banned the use of Haitian language until 1978. In all such cases of colonial conquest, language was meant to complete what the sword had started, due to the mind what the sword had done to the body. An article by Adam Arabich has argued that even the 18th century struggles for the standardization of English had both a national and imperial intent. A standardized English would become, a standardized English would become 
the building block of I quote a metaphysical empire that is an empire of, lang of lit language and literature that would outlive the actual British physical empire. Was that, was this just a fantasy? Actually, this was put into practical language politics in 19th century India, when in a famous minute on Indian education in 1834, uh, in 1834 Macaulay advocated English as a medium of ed education in India in order to create a class of people, those are, these are his words, a class of people, Indian in blood and color, but the other is English in mentality and everything else. The same was happening in those spheres under other European powers. The French and the Portuguese called their version of the Macaulayan process assimilation. Language was a key factor in that assimilation. But neither the French, the Portuguese, nor the British went through the exercise of, for the aesthetic of assimilation. They were not sitting around saying, oh my God, it's so beautiful to assimilate people. You know, look at assimilation and enjoying the aesthetics of their core. No. As Macaulay put it bluntly, it was to create a linguistically westernized middleman who would automatically carry out the intent of the ruler on the masses of the ruled. So along with the economic and political empires, Europe simultaneously and consciously created empires of the mind through language ideologies and practices, empires in tune with their worldview and practical needs. They gave us their accents in exchange for their access to our resources. Accents, we have it, they have access. Has the metaphysical empire outlived the physical empire as envisioned by the advocates of the language spread. I'm not sure myself that the physical empires have gone from entirely. It is often forgotten how much the early phase of the empire, in fact the longest phase in the case of India, was corporate rule. India was under the effective chartered corporate rule of the East India Company from 1757 to 1858, although under its influence much earlier, but under direct colonial rule from 1858 to 1948. East, South, and West African territories, including Ghana, were initially owned by companies long before they became direct colonies. In fact, Macaulay, the advocate and the advocate and the formulator of English as the medium of instruction, the better to create a subservient middle class, was an employee of the British East India Company uh, and he also chaired the Law Commission, which drafted the India in India Penal Code. But even after corporate rule was replaced by a direct colonial rule, the language policy and the Penal Code continued being exported to other British colonial enclaves in varying forms of the same. The corporate phase of the empires remain, though not in the old form. That is, its pre-colonial form has mutated into post-colonial corporate rule 
almost as if the colonial period was a kind of interregnum in the continuity of the corporate rule. Now, I'm going to say that the colonial phase is actually a shorter phase when it covers the rule of the world before and after colonialism. But where royal charters gave corporate rule the political cover it needed then, today privatization gives corporate rule the political and ideological cover it needs. There is also a difference. The first corporate rule was mercantile. Today it's finance. Corporate finance capital rules the globe, a system described in my novel, Wizard of the Crow, as co-colonialism. Corporate rule has gone global, along with it, facilitating it, but also autonomous metaphysical empire. The success of the metaphysical empires can be seen in the very defenders of the dominance of European languages over those of areas and regions outside Europe. The defense this is very interesting, actually. The defense today does not necessarily come from its exporters, but, from the, but rather from the importers. In Africa today, the defenders are African intellectuals and policy makers. Some of them act, literally, act as if it is the English and European languages whose existence is being threatened by African languages. Sometimes African languages are seen as interfering with the, with the English. In fact, Kenya, they have a term for it, uh, coming from the bush. Uh, I remember it, I tell you, when you speak, when you speak English with an, an African accent, they laugh at you. Huh? It looks terrible, look. <laughs> Speaking our English with a, <laughs> Again, by the way, this is not unique. This is not new or unique to Africa, by the way. The defenders of English and arguments in favor of its dominance come from the intellectuals of the colonized periphery as a whole. In the case of English, this phenomenon first manifested itself in England's northern neighbor, that is Scotland. The eminent intellectuals of the 18th century East Scottish Enlightenment, Hume and Smith and others really were ecstatic about standardization of English and its virtues for national formation, even as an imperial export. And there's a case, for instance, of, um, I won't go into it, but for Boswell, uh, who is the biographer of Johnson, who wrote the English Dictionary, you know. Uh, <laughs> it was very interesting. Johnson despised uh, the Scottish. Boswell, the Scottish, was beholden all this. He watched Johnson, but he also, Boswell, defended slavery. Even among the Irish, the greatest defenders of the language or the English were latter day Irish intellectuals. Yet, although Anglo Irish, Responding to the, talk, to the call for Gaelic revival, uh, for the Gaelic revival and the, the Anglicization of Ireland, championed by the Gaelic League, Douglas Hyde and others, said that people should not look to the snows of yesteryear. You know, calling for Gaelic Irish revival was like yearning for the snows of yesterday that English could be imbued with the spirit of the Gaelic, such as to make it Irish. In the end, and despite his Italian article, Joyce embraced the same view. Of course, there's nothing wrong in wanting to take English or any other language as one's own, or doing great things with it, uh, Alayette, Joyce, and Boswell. 
I've always argued that each language, big or small, has its unique musicality. And there's no language whose musicality and cognitive potential is inherently better than any other. African languages, with all their different and unique musicality, are still in everyday use. What seems to horrify these intellectuals, the policymakers, and the international financial services behind them is the, the, the call for a vigorous, literally intellectual, and even scholarly reflection of that reality. You know, they don't mind the language remain oral, but if they become written or written in them, there's something seems the heaven seems to fall. Availability of more information, more knowledge, more skills in those languages, otherwise in daily oral use, will break the nation. Really? But the concentration of the same skills and knowledge in French or French will somehow cement the nation. And the result is very clear. Pampa European languages, pauperized African languages. The entire African language speaking majority are taxed. And this is actually very painful when you come to think of it. Because the entire African language speaking majorities are taxed directly or indirectly so that 90% of the resource available for language education can go to English accents. In some countries, African languages have been unceremoniously axed out of the curriculum or made into electives. Can you imagine an African place making African language in Africa electives? You choose between German and Polish and, you know, say any other African language. Huh? Some advocates of English dominance not only want it to, to be so, but would actually like to see the literary disappearance of native languages altogether. The explanation of this desire, this dead wish for one's own language, and the simultaneous categorical embrace of the dominant other has surely got to go beyond the uses or not of the languages in question. It probably lies in how that sense of dominance was brought about. One set of languages was associated with defeat, shame, incoherence, savagery even, and the other with modernity and science and with human and conquest. No wonder people would want to bask in the sunshine of the language of glory and hide from those of shame and defeat. Whatever the explanation. And by the way, this question of beating children who are speaking continues in Africa today. And the one thing which really all of us would urge is asking African governments to stop criminal and teachers, stop criminalizing African languages. It's criminal to beat a child or humiliate a child because he or she is speaking their mother tongue in a school compound. It's criminal. Whatever the explanation or regional processes, the resulting empires or the minds still impact Africa and the developing world negatively in relation to corporate rule. Since the middle class in Africa talks and behaves as if its needs, its shopping habits, its goals, however self-serving, servile, and ultimately suicidal, are identical with the goals of the nation. So when they talk about the national and official languages, they mean the language spoken and understood by the schooled middle class. For them, 
the language inheritance from Europe is doubly advantageous. According to them, it, it unites the nation, meaning the top 5% in each of the linguistic communities. And it links them to this minority, to the global culture and lifestyle that is a share in a globalized world. An, object, an objection to African languages, which I've heard quite often, is based not only on the fear that it will disunite the nation, but that it will hamper participation in this globalized world, which has first begun very early on the African border anyway. English and European languages give them a seat at the global table. African languages, you see, tarnish their rightful seat in the global table. Hmm. We need a globe, we are told, and that globe can only hear us in English. The English accent blinds them to the reality that when what they are getting from the global table are simply the remnants of the global access to African resources. So what about this? Corporate globe wants unfettered access to the vast resources of the continent. But we have been convinced of the opposite. That is, it's we who need a perfect English accent to reach the globe. So when we are perfecting our English accent, and sometimes, you know, the mirror, you know what I mean? Somebody else huh, is doing something. I don't know if you've seen that film by on Hara by Stephen Wisman. You know, have you seen that film? Yeah. It's a very interesting film because you know after an African middle class gets control of the uh, commerce, chamber of commerce, the Frenchman who is in charge of it now comes back by who and he never says a single word throughout the entire film. But he's always behind somewhere. You know, somewhere, everywhere, he's always there. Now, if, and I say this seriously, if it had been left in the hands and minds of the, some of the policy makers of the formerly colonized, African languages who die forever hidden in a crypt that can never be opened. And by the way, those who saw the film Heritage, I'm sure you saw the dramatization of the same. You remember that guy who is given treasure, I mean, something, something which has so much meaning, and the governor, he goes to the governor, and oh, this is, and he says, you like it? Oh, you can have it, okay? Uh, his heritage, that is. Fortunately for us, even within the current tide of apparent defeat, resistance to the empire of the mind continue. For one, African languages have refused to die, kept vibrant by the peasantry and the urban mass. Orality and the spin of submit, oracha, music and dance, and now even the video or some film as you are alive. In fact, even Europhone African literature constantly draws from this orality. Writing in African language continues, though on a lifeline, with a rich literature in Hausa, Amharic, and Kiswahili. Some publishers, for examples, some publishers like the Tanzanian-based Waterbog, Bugoya, Mukuki Nanyota, continue to give space to writings in African languages, Kiswahili mostly, in the case of Bugoya. Dictionaries of African to African uh, be, uh, languages are being produced. Christian nations continue to do what they have always done so well and effectively, put their message in African languages. We can actually learn from Christian nations because they believe their message completely, therefore they want that message to be available in almost every language, however small. We, 
We think our knowledge is so precious, we must hide it in English linguistic granaries and lock the key. Hmm? They, the missionaries, have used the art of translation to the advantage of their mission and message. I must say that Henry Chakama has, of Kenya has published Kiswahili translations of nearly all the Europhone works in the Heinemann African Writer series. African translators are coming together, exchanging views and working together. Translation between African languages, uh, working together. Translation between African languages, between African, between African languages, between African languages and European and other languages is a basic way of fighting against the hierarchy of power in language relationship. Kwame Nkrumah envisioned, again, this man, he was so ahead of his time, he says, you know, I was reading that speech again, I was say, oh my God, you know, I wish I read the speech earlier because all I've been doing since over all these 10 years is writing footnotes to Kwame Nkrumah's speech. Huh? But translators and translations need publishers. Professor Fatu So was telling me the other day that her husband, Pat, uh, Pat Jan, spelled as B I G N E, has translated some of the major works of global literature in Wolof, but the translations have not found a publisher. Again, surely, this is where African studies can come in. Despite these efforts, it's the uniform tradition that has the visibility, national and globally. There's a need, therefore, to intensify resistance to the metaphysical empires of language, literature, and scholarship, and make African languages and what is produced in them more visible. And quite frankly, I can sense a bit of movement in the tide, slow but sure. For instance, some English journals, language journals, have begun to carry pieces in African language directly and in translation. The current issue of the Journal of African Cultural Studies has two essays in Yoruba and Ikoyo. The Istanbul Review carries the work of the Ugandan poet Susan Kiguli in both Luganda original and in English translation. The next issue of the Hawaii Poetry Review is carrying part of my long poem in Ikoyo uh, with the English translation. And you go to the website in the internet, the website of Words Without Borders has special issue on writing by African women in African, in African languages with English translation alongside. The internet is thus, op is thus opening a space for resistance. In terms of rewards and visibility, the M-Net Literary Awards in South Africa have pointed the way forward where others give prizes on the condition and that African particip participants don't write in African language. By the way, have you ever had a heard of such a crazy idea? That you give a prize to promote African literature, but you put condition. You must not write in an African language. Can you imagine telling a French, right, that you're promoting French literature, but he cannot write it in Isizu? or Twi, or Ga, hmm? okay, or I, an Englishman, I'm promoting English literature, but he might write in Ga. Huh? Could be a great if they could do that. Anyway, this, where others give prizes on the condition that African participants don't write it in African languages, these South African-based venture, ventures, record, venture recognizes that African languages are legitimate means of creativity and imagination. For the 2013 award, 96 novels were submitted spanning all 11 languages of South Africa. Among the winners were novels in Setuana, Ndembele, Shivenda, in addition to English and Afrikaans. This is 
surely the challenge to African studies. Have African studies departments or centers developed the version of Kwame Nkrumah, or have they become captives of the European metaphysical empire? I'm told, of course, some, some like the Institute of African Research and Studies of Cairo University teaches and offers degrees in Hauz, Amharic, Somali, Luganda, Madinko, Kiswahili, and Flani. And from with their thesis and, with thesis and dissertations in those languages. That's really excellent. But let each African Studies Center, department, whatever, look within itself and ask, has it provided a meaningful home for scholarship in African languages? And even if you go outside Africa, we go to a place like Soros, where they've done a lot for and about you know, African languages. And, co co and collectively, we ask ourselves, how many pamphlets, books, journals in African languages can we produce over the last 50 years of our existence? How many seminars, conferences, can we put together to address the challenges of, the, of an enterprise in African languages? How many translations have we inspired? Translations from European and Asian languages into African languages. Translation between African languages. If, as an outsider say, or any outsider for that matter, if an outsider researcher came to Africa studies to ask for expertise on the history, legal, biological, and environmental vocabulary, philosophy of, say, any Ghanaian language, will I or he or she readily find them in a center of African studies? And this is, I'm asking the same question for each African studies department. Whether it should be centers where, if somebody comes and you want to know about African philosophy, you know, past and present, like they're going to read African thoughts and you know, leaders of thought, they can find those experts there. You want to know about Yoruba philosophy and everything else with Yoruba? It's the, it's in this, you know, experts, professors were disputing in Yoruba about these things and where is exceeding the experience with Swahili philosophers and so on. Now, so will I readily find them in the department? If the answer is no, then we have to ask ourselves if African languages cannot find hope in their own space. Where do they turn? Where do they go? That's why I want to talk about the challenge posed by us to us by one Caribbean Canadian intellectual of African origins. His name is Chike Jeffers. Chike Jeffers has put together a book of original essays on philosophy in seven different African languages, including Wolof, Yoruba, Amharic, Gikoyo, and Luo, with English translation beside them. The book is, and all these philosophers are African, by the way. The book is published by SUNY, that is the State University of New York Press, under the title, Listening to Ourselves. Rightfully, the publishers have hailed the book as, groundbreaking, as a groundbreaking contribution to African philosophy. In my foreword to the book, I commended him for laying to rest the question as to whether written modern philosophy is possible in an African language. It has taken the diaspora once again to show us the way. He is doing, even within the limitations of a Western academy, what should be the norm, what should be the common practice in Africa? Surely, a conference like this ought to be full of scholars who know and even work in several African languages, translators into African languages, theories of African languages, in African languages. Then we can share our finds in whatever language we have in common, including English. 
That way, we shall be drawing from our own strength and knowledge of more than our own without abandoning our own. That is, use English instead of English using us. Every African Study Center should become an advocate of African languages. We should press government to change their anti, basically, African government, they have to change their anti african slavish, suicidal linguistic policies. We should be making resolution after resolution, calling upon each and every country to set up a well funded resource national bureau of African, uh, of, of African languages something equivalent to a ministry in their own territories. Under each central bureau would be constituent bureaus for each of the languages, however small. And we must get rid of this big language dominance policy. They reproduce the same hierarchy of languages. Every, every language, even of five people, is as, as important as a language spoken by a million people in the same territory. These bureaus would actively contribute to language policy and practice, come up with ways of effectively popularizing reading, writing, and scholarizing in African languages. We should work with popular performances. The various national bureaus would then be constituent members of an, Africa, of an, African, Union, an African Union based Pan African Bureau of African Languages. Above all, make knowledge of an African language count in awarding degrees and in promotions at the university civil service. A knowledge of an African language should count in evaluating teachers from abroad also. Make it both cool and clever to know an African language or as sometimes they say in the state these days, make African languages sexy. My friends, it can be done. It has been done. We can do it. Only on this basis can we truly talk of an African renaissance. That is the way forward. The only way of fulfilling the vision of the founding minds of the African studies in Africa 50 years ago. Thank you. He has given us a very heavy charge this evening, and, but I think that we are equal to that task, ladies and gentlemen. We have some presentations to make on behalf of the Institute of African Studies. We'd like to... Last week they gave to us a portrait of Kwame Nkrumah. You can imagine what is coming now. <laughs> Professor Rugi Wationgo, University of California Irvine, the Trevor Scholar and Writer, and our keynote speaker. 